Welcome back to Revolution and Ideology. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And today we are going to uh, finally do our brief foray into the Russian Revolution. Um, we've been a little bit hesitant um, as the YouTube market is oversaturated with uh, Russian revolutionary content, but we figured we'd throw in our take anyway. Uh, it will probably be a little bit more in-depth than some of the um, actually high-quality short ones like from Crash Course or History Simplified or whatever that channel is called. Uh, maybe not as in-depth as some of the other uh, like long-form um, high-quality entries from like RevLef Radio and so on and so forth will probably fit kind of that in-between model. And regardless, we will still probably piss off all of you modern-day LARPers of Trotskyism, Stalinism, and whatnot. So feel free to uh, bash us in the comments. Um, I actually love that we're finally doing this episode because <laughs> this is one of those concepts, one of the topics that is going to piss off everyone. No matter if you're if you're a leftist, you're going to be mad because inevitably you're going to overlook some minutia that doesn't matter whatsoever. I am going to overlook something and they're and going to lose their yeah, minds. Yes. And if you're on the right, you're mad that we're just even talking about this at all. So Right. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to upset some people. I like that, though. That's um, my but favorite. anyway, yeah, this will be our take on it. And like I said, it's been oversaturated. We've had this content ready. I mean, we teach it in classes all the time and stuff, but we just didn't do it just because there's just so much out there. But without further ado, let's let's get the show on the road. Any other commentary before we nope. do it? So let's kick this thing off with the end of absolute Romanov rule. That's where it has to actually begin. So we're going to talk real briefly about the Russian Revolution of 1905, um, super briefly. Actually, so, this is, now that I think about it, this is kind of like fitting chronologically perfectly in the series we're doing on nihilism, because we had just oh yeah, absolutely. finished talking about nihilism at the end of the 19th century in Russia. Right, yeah. Nope, this is it. So, okay, let's talk about the end of absolute Romanov rule. The Russian Revolution of 1905, again, not necessarily the famous one, um, was caused by um, agrarian problems, labor problems, nationality problems, and a problem in education. All of this led to a pretty profound resistance to authority that was taking place throughout Russia. And as Nick has already kind of alluded to, we have an entire like series on um, at least the last two episodes of our nihilism series kind of deal with this issue and all of the thinking that was going around in Russia at this point in time. Not just nihilist thinking, but he talked a little bit about socialism and some of the other debates that were going on anyway. Those were like the philosophers and thinkers discussing the issues via like novels like Fathers and Sons and so on and so forth. But we're actually also talking about the material conditions at the time. And yes, agrarian, labor, nationality, and education problems led to actual resistance, like boots on the ground resistance. I shouldn't say boots. These were peasants. But yes, peasants on the ground resistance. They might so, have had boots. They might have had boots on. They might have had boots on. Um, it was also fueled by a loss, uh, or at least what I'm calling a loss. Some Russians might disagree with me in the Russo-Japanese War. Um, it was a really big like strike against like Russian national pride to fight the Japanese more or less to a standstill. But I would argue as more of a loss. The Japanese got to stay, um, which was not what Russia wanted um, in East Asia. Um, also, there was the um, challenging notions to the idea of divine rule. And Russia is a little bit late to the game here, right? Western Europe had been doing this in the 16, 17, and 1800s. Russia is not getting around to it until the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. And this divine right to rule of the Romanov dynasty tied to, of course, um, patronage by the Eastern Orthodox Church. So a little bit different than like the Catholic Church or the various Protestant denominations um, out West. But still, there was this tie to divine right to rule. Russia had um, historically considered itself as like kind of, especially Moscow, as the third Rome. Um, taking over for Constantinople um, and what was that, 1453 when the Ottoman Empire um, finally took uh, Constantinople. And so what if you're doing the math on that, that's almost 500 years, what, 450 some odd years mm -hmm. of considering themselves like the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and of course, the ties of the monarch to the patriarch and so on and so forth. So anyway, long story short, that is also under, um, under challenge at this moment in time in Russia. Okay. What did the resistance look like? It was essentially based around worker strikes, peasant unrest, and mutinies in the military. That will be like a common theme, especially when we get to 1917 as well. Um, the hallmark event of the 1905 revolution is Bloody Sunday, which took place on January 22nd of 1905. It was led by actually an Orthodox priest himself, Father Capon, and um, he and his protesters ended up being shot by the Tsar's Imperial Guard on the march to the Tsar's Winter Palace. Depending on your sources, between 96 and 132 Russians um, were killed, and it leads to a work stoppage, mostly in the urban areas. The St. Petersburg Soviet was officially established during this, Peter, uh, this par uh, 
this time period, I can't even speak right now, this time period, which of course would later evolve into the very famous Petrograd Soviet. Anyway, um, real quickly, I, uh, we're going to be using this word a lot. Uh, we're literally going to be talking about the formation of the Soviet Union here, but what is a Soviet? Like, it's it's a word that many Americans misconstrue as something like evil or bad. Yeah, or it's like, like a it's, group, a union, a community. Like, that's it. That's yeah. all the word really means. Like, that's it. I mean, literally, the Soviet Union could be considered like union of unions. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably a little bit more convoluted than that, but that's essentially what, like, if you just wanted a real quick, like, uh, surface level understanding of a Soviet, that's what it is. It's during this time, though, during the Russian Revolution of 1905, that a state Duma is established with a multi-party system, and a constitution is established in 1906 as well. What is the Duma, Nick? You know what the Duma is? The Duma is essentially like the Russian version of a parliament. So the Duma is the parliament. So we all, we, yeah, we definitely need to get that out there because the Duma is also going to be playing a role going forward. The Tsar released his own October manifesto during the 1905 um, revolution, which would uh, eventually be undermined by him. So the October manifesto was like the Tsar basically trying to placate the revolutionaries saying, look, we're going to make these changes. Look, baby, I can change. I can change, baby. Um, (laughs) And essentially, like he, oh, oh, even though he's like, I'm going to accept a parliament, so we're ending absolute rule. Like that's key. He's still going to be in charge, but it's going to look more like a constitutional monarchy, like in England or something along those lines. Well, and there's so many parallels here right. between the French Revolution and this, like that. Uh, true. Happens, right? Oh, absolutely. That's a, that, those are good parallels as well. Um, but eventually, he's going to undermine the authority of the Duma with Article Number 87 in the 1906, I almost said 2006, 1906 Fundamental State Laws, which ended up dismissing the first two Dumas as they continued to legislate things that, of course, stripped power from the Tsar. So, of course, he ends up like overriding what they're able to do. But in modern terms, we would say like vetoing their legislation through articles like uh, Number 87. The problems, as you might imagine, that Russia was experiencing agrarian labor nationalism education still persisted however one of the big issues was based around land peasants believed rightfully so in my opinion that those that work it should own it again russia's a little bit behind the rest of europe in this case um in regards to like feudalism there was still a lot of what we would just call straight up feudalism in russia as early as the turn of the 20th century um they still had like landed peasants tied to like nobility and 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 working contracts or even oral contracts in this case um, and they believed that that was, that was wrong. They had gotten behind the eight ball in that regard, and they were. Yeah, so, and like we talked about in the episode on fathers and sons, right? There was this really this ideological shift that was happening in Russia at the time away from feudalism. It just took a while. Yeah. And these surf laws weren't even like centuries old as they had been in in whatever, uh, you know, France or Germany or whatever. The, uh, some of these surf laws were as recent as 1861. So mm-hmm. Russia was like really behind the times in regards to like Enlightenment era uh, political thinking, at least at the top, I should say. Uh, clearly not uh, among the philosoph- ph- uh, philosophers that Nick has been telling us about for the last couple of weeks. Anyway. There were also limitations in um, the ability of peasants to eventually acquire land on their own and free themselves from their contracts, which led to mass urban migration. Just like in any industrial era, lots of people were fleeing the rural lifestyle to go to the urban lifestyle. Unfortunately, unlike in maybe in England or even the United States, uh, the cities could not handle this in terms of labor because Russia was not nearly as industrialized as those countries. So people were like moving there with like nothing to do. So Mm -hmm. they don't have land um, to farm or work for subsistence. They move to the cities looking for jobs and they can't find jobs either. So basically like just rampant unemployment and homelessness in the major cities, um, especially again in the European part of Russia. This led to misery. There was overcrowded housing, poor sanitation. Um, If you were lucky enough to find a job, you were working 10 hours a day, six days a week, maybe even more than 10 hours a day. That was like on the extreme low end. To give you an example, Nick, of like the the population growth, between 1890 and 1910, the population of St. Petersburg, of course, at that time, the most important city um, in Russia, grew from 1,033,000 to 1,900,000. So it almost had doubled Mm -hmm. in a mere 20 years. And that's just like another almost million people with like nowhere to work, uh, not enough food, etc. So it's basically 
all the horrors of an industrial society to include changes in expectations, um, to include relative and comparative deprivation. I don't know if you want to chime in on what deprivation theory is, like super briefly. Nah, it'll be too long. Okay, all right. We Check won't. out. We have other episodes. We have other episodes on deprivation theory, but they were experiencing this type of deprivation um, in the cities. And I will say this, though. This gathering of masses in the urban areas did lead to the spreading of new ideas. Um, close quarters inadvertently created a new solidarity, ultimately, which we would call the urban proletariat. And again, that's not a, a Russian word. It's not even a word that Marx invented. He used it, obviously, quite often. But we can date that all the way back to the Roman Empire, which is kind of fitting when we're talking about the Romanov dynasty. But anyway, so a new urban proletariat forms in contrast to um, the peasant uprisings in the rural areas uh, because of the mass migration. Okay, world war is going to make things even worse on these people already experiencing um, the horrors of trying to become an industrialized society without um, the material or ideal conditions ready uh, at the ready. So, okay. There's not enough time in 1905 to actually fix all of the problems with the bureaucratic autocracy. Um, they are also, obviously, as we just discussed, never dealt with land reform. Um, and when you add in the threat of war and the mass conscription that was taking place, what you're doing is you're setting up conditions that are going to lead to uh, just a mass of wildly unhappy people, um, especially fighting a war that would eventually grow to be very unpopular in Russia. Uh, and like I said, this is tied to also losing the most recent war they had just fought with the Japanese. Um, as war broke out in 1914, Russia um, consistently found itself losing battles to Germany. And these battles revealed how far behind Russia was to the Russians themselves. It's one thing to hear about it like in the news, via the newspapers or via the telegram at the time. It's one thing to hear about it philosophically if you were lucky enough to be in the ivory tower of academia, but to actually now see it on the battlefield, mm -hmm. how advanced industrial society Germany was in comparison to Russia, it really um, showed how far they, how far behind they were, which added like another element of frustration for the Russian people. Like you're sending us to the front lines to deal with the expansionist Germany, and we can't even deal with that. Like we can't just continue to send wave of wave, wave after wave of soldiers when we don't even have the equipment to do so. Um, so absolutely, okay. Um, one of the more famous examples of this that really led to a lot of frustration was called the Battle of the Tannenbergs. Uh, that the Battle of the Tannenberg, we'll throw that out there for the war historians that want to look that battle up a little bit, but that was one of the battles that was like a resounding Russian loss that revealed, again, just how technologically behind the Germans they were. Okay. The king at the time, the czar, I should say, I actually haven't even mentioned him by name yet, I probably should, but this is Nicholas II. He ends up um, taking personal control of the army himself during World War I in 1915. This was kind of like a PR campaign. Like, he's not some sort of, like, military mastermind or anything along those lines. This was a PR campaign. His people are frustrated. They're upset with him. Um, Parliament, even or the Duma, is calling him out, even though he's kind of, like, neutered them a little bit. This was him basically saying, look, I will go to the front line and I will lead this army um, to show you uh, basically how it's done. Uh, did not matter. <laughs> the Russian military kept losing, um, and he, of course, looks responsible for these losses now. It actually backfires on mm -hmm. him. Okay, so now the king's leading the charge and we're doing worse. Um, so anyway, basically from 1950 on, there was a, the Russian military was in a constant state of retreat to the German forces. Um, and eventually, when, when the Ottoman Empire uh, joins in, they'll also be in a constant state of retreat uh, against Ottoman forces as well. Uh, another uh, really dumb move um, by the Russian autocracy at this time was when uh, Nicholas went to take control of the army. He left the Tsarina Alexandra uh, left to rule. Normally, that's not a problem. I would argue that women are, are, are oftentimes better leaders than men, although in this specific case, that did not work out because, of course, uh, she um, eventually ceded her autonomy and and power uh, and ability to rule to a mystic, a man named Rasputin. He's very famous. He probably deserves an episode. I am not going to do that guy justice here. Again, A, because uh, content on Rasputin is oversaturated. Like you can find hundreds of documentaries on this guy that you couldn't kill and all that other stuff. Um, but uh, long story short, why did Rasputin have this mystic hold on the Tsarina um, Alexandra? Like what was he holding over her head uh, to have almost... I don't want to say like executive power, but way more power than just an everyday priest should have of, over the uh, Russian Empire. Wasn't her sick kid? Yeah. Yep. He uh, swore he could uh, uh, 
uh, heal the prince from his hemophilia. And that was essentially like they would perform these ceremonies and these rituals. Um, and every once in a while, something would kind of work. And he was able to use that as an excuse for his growing, of course, spiritual power. And he was able to kind of hold that over the royal family. All right. The Ottoman Empire, as I previously mentioned, joins the Central Powers during World War I and further hurts the Russian economy by cutting off their trade routes and supply lines to Russian troops as well. So there's less resources being funneled into Russia because of, of course, ge geographically, the Ottoman Empire is between Russia and, of course, a lot of the ports that it had been trying to access since the uh, 1800s. Um, but it's also cutting off the supply lines for Russian troops. So you have, like, everyday Russians suffering back home, and then you have the troops also suffering already, and now they're having a harder time getting supplies. This led to a much higher cost of living for farmers. Um, they began to hoard foodstuffs, which meant that now the supplies coming from the rural areas in terms of foodstuffs stuff. We're not making it to the urban area. So people in the urban environment are now suffering from starvation as well. And it, again, you just have the perfect conditions. Theta Scotchpah would argue these are the structural conditions that would lead to revolution. Um, th this also led to rampant inflation. These price hikes uh, led to numerous demands for higher wages in the factories. Um, and this, of course, would be aided by the revolutionary propaganda that was funded, <laughs> not coincidentally, by Germany, um, which led to widespread strikes. Now, why would Germany have any vested stake in spreading revolutionary propaganda in Russia? To destabilize their enemy in war, in this case. That's simple. Uh, there was also uh, high rises in crime, as you might imagine. When people are suffering. They will resort to stealing, theft, and, and other unsavory actions. Um, so crime became a problem, especially in the urban areas as well. The working class women in St. Petersburg... Um, would spend upwards of 40 hours a week in food lines. Um, 40 hours, a, like that's like a job, mm -hmm. just waiting in line for food. So it's kind of funny that when we think of like communist Russia, we're thinking of bread lines, but also we have to think of like when we're thinking of like imperialist Russia, we're also, the bread lines seem to be like a common Russian theme right. um, at this point in time because of uh, poor leadership nine times out of, well, actually 10 times out of 10. <laughs> Let's not even go nine, 10 times right. out of 10. Um, many of these working class women would have to, of course, go house to house and beg, and this led to a rise in prostitution as well, as you might imagine, um, which, uh, of course, led to further destabilization of like families. And of course, we know destabilization at home leads to de destabilization in the streets. And of course, it is like uh, uh, an upward trajectory in this case. So a security force that had already been um, in place called the Okhrana, this is like the um, Tsar's security police, the Okhrana, um, this is a, a quote I, I was able to secure from like their observations as of 1916. And again, I quote, the possibility in the near future of riots by the lower classes of the empire enraged by the burdens of daily existence. I kind of like, it's, it's not a complete quote, but I think the reason I chose this quote specifically is even the czar's like secret police force is basically saying in a report to him that like, look, dude, like this, this is not good. Like things are going to go down whether you like it or not. And there's probably not going to be a lot that we can stop about or not a lot we can do to stop it. Um, any commentary there? Nope. Okay. Resistance during the war gains traction, again, between 1914 and 1916. It actually, some might argue, starts on the front lines as well. So we talked about the conditions like in the rural areas. We talked about the conditions in the cities. In terms of the front lines, the actual troops also start this process. I mentioned mutinies all the way back in 1905. Well, it becomes a thing again. There will be mutinies on the front lines of the war. They become rampant as soldiers begin to challenge their commanding officers and just basically remove themselves from service. A, they know what's going on back home and they want to go back and help. And B, they're done basically dying for a cause that is, you're not going to win. You're not beating the Germans. Right. They're not equipped. They're not led properly. So why fight this war? Casualty rates by 1915, um, in terms of Russia, there were 390,000 dead Russians by 1915. That's the first year of the war. In one year, they lost 390,000 troops. One million were injured. 
An entire new officer class was sent out to the front line full of soldiers now of either peasant or working class stock. This is actually going to be a revolutionary advantage. So again, so many officers had died from the old guard that a new guard of officers shows up and these officers are actually a little bit more like revolutionary thinking because they were back home either in the rural resistance or in the urban resistance. So when they go to the front lines, even though they've been conscripted, they have a little bit more, I don't know, A, they're a little bit more revolutionary and more um, empathetic to the revolutionary cause and more willing to work with their soldiers in their mutinies. So it actually backfires a little bit. Um, they begin to bring these political ideas that are circulating, especially in the urban areas, to the soldiers and basically begin to make the argument on the front lines of World War I that this war is equivalent to the class struggle. Basically, uh, they are the poor fighting for the rich, fighting for the autocracy. Again, we've referenced it before, but System of a Down like laid this out for it. Why do they always send the poor? Yeah. This, is, this is it. They were asking this all the way back in 1915, these, uh, these Russian officers. Um, okay. There were even reports of certain Russian officers fraternizing with German officers, basically just like having discussions about like, okay, so how can we destabilize, essentially destabilize our own autocracy? We'll get out of the war. You guys do whatever you do. We don't really care right. what's going on with you guys. We want to get back to Russia. Okay. The political parties begin to get involved too at this point in time. So we've got resistance in the rural areas, resistance um, in the urban areas, and re now resistance on the front lines of the war, political parties are gonna go again, get involved. This seems to be like kind of a common revolutionary element where like the grassroots movement ends up being co-opted by politicians and this is essentially what's happening here. The Central War Industries Committee uh, under a dude named Alexander Guch, uh, Guchkov um, gets the Petrograd Mensheviks to eventually join the revolutionary car, car the revolutionary cause um, which led to reforms that would be as one might imagine rejected by the Tsar in the Duma. So but it's important that these politicians are basically be beginning to see what's like already happening on the ground and seeking to create the reforms to stabilize the country, but the czar is rejecting them. So they're actually trying to like essentially like head off a revolution mm -hmm. and make it more of a peaceful transition of power. Okay. At this point in time, we also see the rise of the Bolsheviks. What's the difference between Mensheviks, Mensheviks and Polsh... Uh, I can't even speak. Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. Uh, the words simply mean minority versus majority. Like that's the main difference. Now, in terms of political ideology, there are some pretty big differences. One, if we were to use modern day terms, I would coin the Mensheviks as more like traditional just liberals and the Bolsheviks as more the radical left. Anything you want to add to that no, commentary as a sociologist here? No. Okay. This split in the Russian Social Democratic Party um, actually dates all the way back to 1903, if we want to just rewind for a, sec for a second, between a gentleman named Julius Martov and, of course, the very famous V.I. Lenin, who I will be getting to here in just a minute, um, and their basic, um, I would say, ideological debates, um, as well as practical debates. They definitely had differences of opinion like on, on, on the material um, goals of a change in power, so definitely that. Okay. Simply put, though, the differences in um, meaningless nonsense between these two, again, one just kind of like moderate left, one far left, um, leads to a lot of nonsense that tends to happen at the political level um, and leads to, of course, class alliances, historical um, material conditions that lead to fracturing of the Russian left, which again should ring a bell for modern day uh, leftists who uh, often comment that the left is fractured. Um, we can see this taking place during the Russian Revolution. If the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks had actually learned to work together all the way back in 1903 when I first cited that, um, the transition could have taken place a lot quicker and a lot more peacefully and probably saved a lot of lives because it would have made World War I go very differently. But anyway, uh, it's, it's just something that we had to discuss real quickly. Back to the reforms that the Duma had proposed to the Tsar, these rejected reforms led to um, Guchkov himself considering a coup against the crown. Exiled leaders at this point in time, exiled revolutionary leaders, people that have been exiled from Russia, are also now in Europe debating how to move forward while considering the events of World War I and the politicking in Western Europe. Um, unfortunately, even among most of these thinkers, these revolutionary thinkers in Russia, um, nationalism ends up trumping worker solidarity. So I guess what I'm trying to say here in not so many words is that many of the Russian revolutionary thinkers still put like Russia first over 
framing what should have been a global proletariat. So rather than making alliances with maybe the German proletariat or even the French proletariat or even the British proletariat, that, I mean, those proletariats would have been even more apt as they were allies of Russia at the time. Um, not necessarily like friendly allies, but allies. Rather than working on creating like this proletariat to deal with the world war at hand, they focused more on like an insular Russian nationalism as part of the revolutionary movement. Why do you think they chose that during World War One? more the Russian nationalist revolutionary cause than the global proletariat cause i mean i think because the war was at the forefront of everyone's mind right it probably lended to creating a heightened sense of nationalism for everyone and specifically if you're russian at the time you're seeing what's going on in the streets of your town right and both at the war and locally at home like you said so you're really like the immediate need is to fix what's going on in your backyard basically Absolutely. Exemplifying this would be uh, a couple of like of the more famous revolutionary thinkers at the time. Um, Georgi Plenkanov, he kind of goes with a very strong anti-German sentiment in like his revolutionary politicking, while on the other hand, um, another famous revolutionary, Alex Parvis, goes very pro-German victory to essentially create a power vacuum in Russia. So essentially what Plekhanov is saying is like Mother Russia matters more than the revolution, so we must protect Russia, so don't do anything to help the Germans, whereas Parvis is saying... Let's just help the Germans, because if they kick our ass, that's going to create a power vacuum, and we can use that to seize the means of production, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 I mean, let's play like armchair, like Russian revolutionary. Which do you think you would have chosen back at the time? Oh, God, I think that's an impossible answer, but... Oh, man. I don't know. I don't even know. That's a tough one. I would think that more... The problem is that helping the Germans win essentially has global like ramifications, not just in Russia, you know, so it's tough to pick like the lesser of two evils or the greater of two evils, right. I guess, however you look at it. These are the things being debated, debated at a very uh, famous conference that took place in 1915. It's called the Zimmerwald Conference. Um, it is a multinational socialist meeting that takes place. The manifesto was written by another famous guy I'm about to talk about here in just a second. His name is Leon Trotsky. Of course, that's not his birth name, but we'll get to that. Although, hold up, I want to go back now to my answer and say, like, okay. <laughs> now that I'm thinking it through, like, if you're actually a socialist, there's no room for nationalism in your philosophy or politics. So. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. But again, it's it's very difficult, like, if you haven't walked a mile in someone's yeah. shoes, right? Like, people are literally dying on the front line, and you just want the war over one way or the other. Right. Um, and who knows what the Germans are going to do, like, if they, mm -hmm. like, capture Moscow or something like that, right? right? Like. Um, okay, anyway, so in the words of Leon Trotsky at the Zimmerwald conference, this is what he had to say. The war which has produced this chaos is the outcome of imperialism, of the attempt on the part of the capitalist classes of each nation to foster their greed for profit by the exploitation of human labor and of the national treasures of the entire globe. Any thoughts on Trotsky here? This is where he begins to build his, like this uh, iconography, like it really yeah. gets built at the Zimmerwald conference as this revolutionary thinker, philosopher, also strategist. I mean, he ends up, of course, leading the Red Army itself. Um, but this is where that iconography begin. But this is where he really like starts to like take like leaps into like the social structure of the global proletariat. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Lenin, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit further left than others um, at this time, including Leon Trotsky. Now, Leon Trotsky is going to get more radical later on down the line when he's actually involved in the revolution a little bit more so. But at this point, Lenin's the one that's a little bit further left. He led a ra radical minority at the Zimmerwald conference called the Zimmerwald Left in opposition to a lot of what was being discussed. He's there with a man named Grigory uh, Zinoviev and Karl Radek. Excuse my Russian pronunciations for those of you that are... Um, um, uh, whatever russian speakers i was trying to think of the word native russian speaker what am i trying to say like whatever that, like that's your native tongue anyway um this is what he has to say from the standpoint of the working class and of the laboring masses from the lesser evil would be the defeat of the czarist monarchy so essentially even these two very famous leaders we're now talking about that again i'll get into a little bit more detail here in just a second lenin is more like the monarchy has to go. Like, that's point number one. Trotsky's still more like, eh, we need to end the war first. So, again, it's kind of funny to say this, but ending Russian involvement in World War I is the more conservative out, uh, uh, proposal at this point in time. Right. Uh, just interesting to think about. 
Meanwhile, there are reports of corruption, corruption and incompetence now flooding in from everywhere um, at the center of the Romanov dynasty. Um, so basically, a lot of what was happening behind closed doors with Rasputin and the Tsarina while the Tsar was off playing war games, God knows where, losing battles, um, that hadn't been made public. But by the time we get to the uh, end of the Zimmerwald conference, people are starting to realize how incompetent the Romanovs are actually are. And a lot of the accusations center on the influence of the aforementioned Grigory Rasputin. Uh, Rasputin himself would end up be assa being assassinated in 1916, not by the revolutionaries. This is like commonly misunderstood. He's assassinated by pro-Tsarist nobles. Why do you think when we frame the, um, oftentimes the framing, the very famous assassination, and it was very difficult to kill the man, right? Like that's the whole mythos behind him. But we usually say it's like the, a lot of people think it's like the, the to be blunt, the communists that kill Rasputin. It's not. It's the, it's the Tsarist nobility that kills Rasputin. Why do we think that? Any. I mean, I would think just because the general narrative is to try to make the communists out as bad guys. The first attempt at assassinating Rasputin took place actually in 1914. He was stabbed in the stomach. Of course, then there goes the lore. How much of this lore is true? How much of it is not is often debated. But aside from being stabbed, he was poisoned, he was shot, and he was eventually dumped off a bridge. Um, the Grand Duke Nicholas, not Nicholas II, um, was also asked to seize the throne um, in the absence of Nicholas II. So this is a Grand Duke. Basically, they're like, look, you, you, Nicholas is gone playing war. The Tsarina is clearly not fit to rule, and Rasputin is dead now. Grand Duke, come take the throne. Um, now, let's talk about the characters I want. I already too briefly mentioned, but I think most of our listeners are very well aware of these individuals. Okay, Vladimir Lenin. He lived between 1870 and 1924. He is, of course, a revolutionary legend. He is either famous or infamous, depending on your perspective. Um, in terms of who he was, he was born to a middle-class family. He was well-educated. Um, even though his dad was technically a serf, he uh, was the pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps type of serf that eventually rose up as a physician and a mathematician, and he himself became a renowned teacher. So kind of a success story there. Unfortunately, Lenin's dad died of a brain hemorrhage. Um, Lenin, at this point in time, when his dad dies, um, really begins to question his fairly religious Orthodox upbringing. He was about 16, I think, when his dad died. Um, Lenin also had a very radical thinking brother. His brother was a little bit more radical thinking than him, Sasha, Sasha Lenin, um, who was attending school at the University of St. Petersburg. He was so radical that he eventually is executed um, for um, formulating a plot to kill the Tsar. I don't know if you knew that, that, that mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, Lenin himself would be more radicalized at the University of Kazan. He ends up joining societies while he's in school, secret societies, so to speak, and it's there that he is reading everything from Chernyshevsky's, we've already talked about it, what is to be done, to Marx's Capital. So it's there that he's absorbing the stuff that Nick already talked about in our episode on um, Russian nihilism. So anyway, that's where he begins to learn about these ideas. Um, it's at the University of Kazan. While he's there, Lenin's mom gets a little bit worried about him um, in terms of like his ability to provide for himself because of all the conditions I just got done talking about, ends up buying him a farmhouse in Samara. Um, she basically is like, you should just calm down. Um, go have a little farm, go live your own little life. It's like Jeffersonian agrarianism in Russia is what she, <laughs> is what she wants. And everything will just kind of take care of itself. Um, he clearly doesn't care. He ends up selling the land that his mom bought for him and then goes all philosophical on that ass. Um, okay. But uh, he ends up moving to St. Petersburg instead of going to Samara to become a farmer. He then travels Europe seeking more Marxist knowledge, and he forms his own groups, the most important being the Social Democrats. Um, and then he returns to Russia only to be arrested for um, uh, the charge of sedition. Uh, he ends up exiled in Siberia for th three years, and it is there that he begins to write, like a lot, like a lot of Lenin's writings that he makes while he's um, in exile in Siberia can be found um, free online. Just type in, type in for the PDF in Google, and you will find a lot of what he wrote about. It's also during this time that he founds a newspaper called Iskra, um, which was a wildly popular far-left underground newspaper. This is important, of course, for revolutionary theory. We've talked about it with the French Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, and other revolutions. We talked about the American War for Independence. We've talked about it like this spreading of like underground, like pamphleteering, more or less, and like kind of spreading the ideals of the radical. Um, it's also and interesting that we've talked about this a lot, this idea that people that become important in social movement like leaders, etc. oftentimes at some point in their life, they're either in prison or exiled, they have time to think and to write and to form their ideas. 
right? And Lennon's just yeah, a perfect Lennon's example another of that. example. Castro was an example. Shoot, mm-hmm. Gramsci. Uh, mm-hmm. You have an episode on him. Prison Notebook is literally his most famous yeah. right like set of of, of writings. Absolutely. Nelson Mandela. Like, yep. I mean, you get, there's countless. Uh, Dr. King, Birmingham Jail, even mm-hmm. though he's not in there nearly as long as some of these other guys. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, it's during this time after he's done with his exile that he travels to Munich, London, and Geneva, um, and other, of course, important cities in Europe to continue his studies. Um, and he also becomes very famous for, um, during meetings and stuff, being able to speak up and provide, of course, rhetoric that attack way less radical thinkers. And it is here that he garners his own kind of iconograph- iconographic like following. Um, This really takes place after 1905. He eventually ends up in Bern, um, Switzerland, during World War I, dot, dot, dot. Essentially, it is there that he is going to be when all of the events I just got done, like, kind of previewing take place. So now we've kind of got Lenin situated in Bern during, like, the 1915, 1916 part of World War I. So he's in Switzerland. Other guy I want to talk about. It is not Joseph Stalin. We're not actually going to be talking about Joseph Stalin a whole lot today um, for reasons. um, Reasons. We'll just say for reasons. Um, Not very revolutionary by any stretch of the imagination. Um, He probably deserves an episode um, where we debate uh, (laughs) how um, uh, loyal he was to Marxism and Leninism and the ideals of of the revolutionary cause. Um, Most would argue not very loyal, but uh, again, that deserves its own episode. There's a super good episode that Rev Left has. uh, It's long, like three or four hours long that they did with with Proles of the Round Table, I think. Yeah. Where they talk about Stalin. It's, I think, overly pro-Stalin, but it's still, it's really good. Like, if you want a long, like, deep dive into Stalin, the most Stalin you could have ever in your life, like, just check that one out. We, yeah, we even uh, assign a reading called Why Did Stalin Succeed Lenin? And more or less, it's like, because most people would argue it, it, well, not most people. It seems pretty split at this point. I, I'm not sure how Stalinism is still a thing. But regardless, okay, moving on. Like, how... Stalin being Stalin somehow succeeded Lenin when it could have been this other guy I'm going to talk about, Trotsky. Um, Anyway, we can, maybe Nick can link that rating or something along those lines, but it's a pretty good debate. All right. Anyway, Leon Trotsky, 1879 to 1940. Is he the rightful successor to Lenin? That's a debate I guess we'll have um, at the end of this episode. Maybe we won't even have it. Like You guys can debate that in the comments if you guys want to. But anyway, Leon Trotsky. He was born to a wealthy farming Ukrainian Jewish family. At the age of eight, he was sent to Odessa for a formal education. He ended up moving to uh, Nikolaev in 1897 under the name of Lvov. He wrote and printed leaflets and proclamations and distributed revolutionary pamphlets to essentially stir the masses. Again, he kind of starts off the same way as Lenin, using like propaganda to kind of get people thinking, and we really appreciate that. His first wife, Alexandra, ends up winning him over to Marxism like formally, though. So he wasn't necessarily a Marxist even when he was like pamphleteering um, until he met his more radical thinking wife. Um, so that's kind of an important um, like like growth point in his life as a revolutionary. He ends up imprisoned, just like Lenin, in Moscow for two years. I, Lenin was in Siberia, but he ends up in prison, just like all the other revolutionaries we talked about, in Moscow for two years. It is here that he kind of learns of this very famous man named um, Vladimir Lenin. He then himself ends up exiled to Siberia for three years, and like Lenin, he studied, he wrote, he became even more radical, and eventually writes for Lenin's newspaper, Iskra. Um, Maybe you don't know this, but like, when do they first link up? I like face to face. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I know. I mean, it had, I actually don't know. I'll just flat out say, I don't know when their first face to face meeting is or their first correspondence. Um, If anyone does know, feel free to leave it in the comments. If you can back it with a source, like this is the first time Lenin and, and Trotsky actually wrote to each other or met face to face. That would be perfect. But I'm willing to admit when I don't know something and I don't know that. So Okay. He ends up escaping Siberia, the, his exile in Siberia, in a wagon um, without his family. He actually leaves his family behind. So when he, when he was exiled, um, I guess the Tsar was kind of nice and at least like exi- exiling people with like their, their family. He leaves Siberia without his family. Um, and it's actually kind of heartbreaking. He leaves without his families and his daughters eventually like die. Um, so kind of a really sad story. His first wife ends up, Alexander, who we just talked about, ends up being hunted down later in her life by Joseph Stalin and killed in 1935. Like, 
yeah i mean i don't know any thoughts on that i, I, I mean it wasn't stalin like himself but yeah. but yes yeah. by, by, by you stalin. made it sound like i picture stalin in the woods with a rifle but that's not what it was like handsome stalin yeah. right like handsome stalin everyone knows that like one picture of him we're like man stalin's kind of handsome yeah. he's like young right like yeah. anyway yeah um actually in 1935 he would not have been young anymore but okay um, he officially changes his name to Trotsky from Bronstein. I guess I never mentioned his original like last name was Bronstein during this period of time as well. Around 1905, the 1905 revolution, Trotsky officially is identifying as a Menshevik. Again, the slightly less radical like um, um, uh, political party at the time. But he does seek to reconcile the differences between the party split, between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks. He also works on a theory of, quote-unquote, permanent revolution. Basically, the peasant masses cannot wait for productive forces to be right, in air quotes, that the revolution must be perpetual and constant, that there will be, he would be against structuralist arguments by like Theta Scotchpah, who came <laughs> a long way later in life. He would argue that volunteerism and constant volunteerism is the way to perpetuate the revolution. Thoughts? No, I mean, this is just his biggest, this is the theory that Trotsky is most famous for, still to this day, is permanent revolution. Um, he ends up being arrested as part of the Petrograd Soviet. Um, he ends up in Siberia again, but escapes en route to Siberia. So he's really good at escaping Siberia. Mm -hmm. uh, first, he escapes from Siberia in like a, like a wagon, more or less. Then he escapes before he's even sent out to Siberia, which is like impressive. You have to think like Russia is so much bigger than we can even like even imagine or fathom. And how far Siberia is from like these urban centers of revolutionary um, thought, uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, etc. We're talking like thousands of miles and he's able to always kind of like escape. Yeah, plus it's not like you're like, oh, I would just jump out of the truck and run into the woods. Like you die. There's no, it's far yeah. from everything and cold he's and a, miserable. He had a lot of friends and probably a pretty good survivalist if I had to guess. Yeah. Um, Anyway, from London, uh, he ends up going to London, then he ends up going to Vienna after this, of course, uh, uh, second escape from Siberia. And this is where he starts his more famous publication, Pravda, which basically just means truth. Um, this is when he has a little bit of a breakup with Lenin due to philosophical differences. Um, and the Bolsheviks then actually jack the Pravda name for their own publication. So Pravda is still actually kind of a wildly famous like leftist publication to this day. Most people associate it with the Bolsheviks, but actually it was Trotsky's first and they end up jacking it because of its notoriety. So little, little piece of trivia there that a lot of people don't necessarily know about. Anyway, during Trotsky's life, he sees World War I, um, which led to his purging when he, at the time in World War I, he was in Spain actually at the time. Mm -hmm. He ends up being kicked out of Spain. He then hangs out in New York City of all places for a little bit. Um, during the February Revolution, he tries to come home, which we haven't got to the February Revolution yet, um, but he ends up being captured by the British where he then leads a prisoner of war protest um, as inspiration, like against like the British imperialism. So he's a POW of the British and ends up getting all the other POWs to like launch this like mini revolution against their captors and the British are like well what do we do with this guy yeah. um, eventually he ends up released as a non-German citizen because technically he's a Russian citizen so he's he's an ally of England so they're like well we can't just hold this dude he's not German he's not like our enemy so he ends up just being released and he they, he ends up being released because he's much more trouble than he's worth because mm -hmm. he keeps leading these POW revolts against his captors yeah, it's like such a Trotskyist thing yeah do. it is such a Trotskyist thing he's actually he's kind of a badass let's let's be be honest um you can see like we definitely side a little bit more towards Trotsky than Stalin just a little bit just anyway all right the February uh, revolution I thought you were gonna say then Lenin but didn't Stalin a lot yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely I, so I'm willing to admit like here like on the on the pod right this second I would lean more towards Trotsky than Lenin as well yeah. uh, I really would but that's a whole yeah maybe we'll do a different episode on that okay February Revolution, February 23rd uh, to March 16th. So we've talked about two of our main actors. I gave you a little bit of a bio on Lenin and Trotsky. Anything else you want to add before we kick into the most famous part of this revolutionary process? No, I think we're good. Okay. In 1917, the Petrograd workers launched strikes and demonstrations culminating at Putilov, the largest industrial plant in Petrograd, St. Petersburg. Oddly, the next day, the Tsar heads to the war front himself again. He had taken a brief foray there. He had come back, and then he takes another brief foray there. So again, like there is this like massive like strike set of strikes and demonstrations. Something you would think the king would actually want to be there to deal with. Instead, he just bounces to the war front. Nope, not dealing with it. I'm out. I'm going back to the war front. My people will see me as a hero. He was wrong, but that's what he decides to do. International Women's Day also happens to take place at this point, and 
amid already the hotbed of strikes and demonstrations and all the things that I was talking about in the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of this episode, all of that kind of boils over. International Women's Day was already like on the schedule, already on the on 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 the docket of things that were going to take place. So this kind of like works its way into the already existing protests. The marchers that were marching for International Women's Day in these urban centers join the people in that were already on strike or already protesting the regime or already protesting, to be blunt, the material conditions of that time. This is when rumors of food shortages in the cities during the strike slash Women's Day March lead to actual full-blown bread riots. Um, so I think this is kind of like important where we can see like the conditions are already ripe for an actual revolutionary process. 250,000 people during this time, during Women's Day, end up on strike and protesting. That is a large people basically like marching through the streets. They end up calling for a couple of things. The three things that are most importantly that you might hear chanted in the streets at this moment in time, most notably in Petrograd, but also to a lesser extent in places like Moscow, would be A, end the war. We're done. We're done fighting your imperialist war. B, or number two, I don't even remember. Was I using letters or numbers at this uh-huh. point? Doesn't matter. End the food shortage. You got food. We know y'all got food. Give us some fucking food. And three, abdication of the autocracy. You're done. Romanov's done. No more autocracy. So those are the three demands. This is very reminiscent of like the, um, uh, of the women's role um, in the French Revolution during their um, siege of Versailles, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term. Siege is not what I wanted to use, but whatever. So it's very reminiscent of that. The Duma at this time is around still, but it's super weak. Like I said, they were completely neutered by various articles written into the Constitution by the Tsar himself. But the weak Duma is highly reactionary to what's going on to these strikes, and eventually they end up being suspended by the Tsar via telegram. So dude's not even there himself anymore, but he sends a telegram basically saying don't do anything, guys, you're done. Mm -hmm. He orders uh, Kabalov, which was part of the Petrograd military, to basically disperse the crowd, disperse a crowd of 250,000 people with rifle fire. How's this going to go? Like, do you think they're really going to just like shoot in the sky? Like, that's not going to be a thing. Other regiments eventually seek intervention on behalf of the demonstrators, and they are then accused of open mutiny. Mutiny, excuse me, mutiny, mutiny. So essentially you have one regiment, the Kabbalah, bas- the Kabbalah regiment, basically like firing on the crowd more or less. But then you have other regiments that are like, these are our people, do not fire on them. We don't give a shit what the Tsar says. So then they end up being like mutineers. So you even have like the revolutionary like fracture within the military itself. Okay, which structuralists would argue is absolutely necessary for a successful revolution. Any successful revolution in the modern era, and we would consider the early 20th century part of the modern era, requires the um, existing standing army to partake on the side of the revolutionaries. So sure. this would be in a, a necessary condition for a successful revolution. Anyway, the wealthy elite leave the Tsar's Duma and then decide to form their own provisional government committee. Basically, it's called the Vis- Provisional Committee of the State Duma. So essentially, like the Tsar's Duma that had been completely neutered by the Tsar, they're basically, we're not part of your Duma, we're creating a new Duma called the Provisional Committee of State Duma. Um, Though they don't formally take the revolutionary side, they see the revolutionaries as like uneducated and people like reactionary and so on. We're the elite politicians, we'll eventually be like the intelligentsia and so on and so forth. So we're not necessarily on your side, but we're not on the Tsar's side either. We want to basically take the conditions that you've set for us And like, just basically seize them. Like you guys are doing all the hard work in the streets and we're just going to end up taking credit and writing a bunch of laws about it later. That's essentially what the provisional government wants to do. Um, And they definitely distance themselves from the czar. The Petrograd Soviet at this time is also kind of watching from the sidelines and they officially begin to make their own reforms internally as well. I must stress that the people, i.e. the actual proletariat, don't care what either the Soviet nor the Duma are doing. They don't care about bankers and businessmen and philosophers and academics. Uh, They would consider them armchair revolutionaries. They don't care. They are going to continue to like burn this village to the ground, to use a very famous term. Um, They're burning the courts. They're burning the police station. They occupied all transportation, um, like depots, like train stations and so on, bus stations, and not bus stations, buses weren't even a thing, but, but train stations, 
prisons and so on and so forth. They end up occupying like the city arsenals and they also go to prisons and release prisoners. This seems to be like a common thing as well, right? Mm -hmm. From the La Moncada barracks in Cuba to the um, the Bastille in France. I, I don't know. What Again, let's refresh our memory for listeners that maybe you have not heard our episodes on the War for Independence or the French Revolution or the Cuban Revolution. Why is this like a revolutionary cause, opening up prisons and freeing prisoners? Like what's the what's the what's I mean, the prisons point? represent the oppression of the regime and so that by imprisoning the quote-unquote deviants right that's a reflection of the power of those in charge at the time so by releasing them you're clearly going against that power both materially and symbolically dope dope okay so there is a, a pretty interesting telegram from the time period. It was written on February 22nd, or 26th of 1917. Um, it's from an official named uh, Radzianko, and he's writing this to the czar. It is a telegram. This is what he has to say, and I quote, The situation is serious. The capital is in a state of anarchy. The government is paralyzed. Excuse me. Transport service and the supply of food and fuel have become completely disrupted. General discontent is growing. There must be no delay. Any procrastination is tantamount to death. What he's requesting is, Czar, get your ass back here and handle business. Mm -hmm. um, we know that's not going to work out well for Czar. But other regiments begin to join the fold and join the protesters. They begin to distribute their arms to the protesters. So what were formerly like, like royal, like, regiments are now like joining the protesters and giving the protesters weapons. This is going to lead to, of course, violence. The officers that remain loyal to the czar go into hiding. They don't want to even deal with their own troops at this point because they've lost complete control over their own troops. So after the officers go into hiding, essentially the czar is like trying desperately to get back. Because of the aforementioned like seizing of like transportation depots, most notably like on the rails, he can't get back. He cannot make it back um, to deal with the revolutionary process here. He also ends up being advised by the provisional by the provisional committee to abdicate the throne they're not on the side of the revolutionaries per se but they're willing to like uh co-opt the movement basically to seize power and this is them doing that they're basically like look we're not for the peasants per se or the proletariat we're definitely not for you and you can't get back so just abdicate the throne and we'll take over from here guy it's essentially what they're asking. The last Romanov gasp at this point takes place when Nicholas II asks his uh, Grand Duke, another Grand Duke, a Grand Duke named Alex, Alexander, to claim the throne. Alexander is like kind of watching this all go on from the sidelines and he's like, hard pass. I, I'm not going to deal with this. I don't want, nope, not, not dealing with it, not dealing with it. <laughs> Um, and uh, the Tsar himself ends up, when he finally gets back, reunited with his family at Alexander Palace. Okay, between February and October. So that's like the February part of the revolution. Basically, the provisional government has, has taken, taken power, for lack of a better term. From February to October, though, we see the growth of what would be called, and I can never pronounce it in Russian, but I'm going to give it a shot. Don't laugh at me. Dvovlaste? I not blew it. Blew it. Anyway, in English, dual power. The provisional government is eventually going to be forced to recognize dual power. They actually don't get to claim all the power. Who are they going to have to share power with? The Petrograd Soviet. They've also kind of been part of this revolutionary process, although not as hardcore as the actual, like, boots on the ground. Again, the mutineers and uh, the women from the Women's March and uh, the strikers um, and the peasants that are now, like, in the, like, on their own landed estates, overthrowing their own, like, lords and dukes and so on and so forth. They, they've really not done any of that. But they're also kind of watching from the sideline, armchair revolutionaries, ready to seize, seize um, the opportunity um, to basically take power. And the Petrograd Soviet is arguing that they are better at seizing the opportunity than the provisional government because at the bare minimum, they at least represent the popular will of the workers and soldiers. Any opinion on that? Basically, we see it here like a union versus a, uh, a parliament, basically. This is a union versus a parliament for who best represents the popular will of the people. What do you think, as the sociologist here, who do you think better represents the popular will of the people? I mean, at people? this point in time, neither of them do because they haven't, there's been no real open and transparent democratic process. 
The Petrograd Soviet's argument is over the provisional government is that technically they think they have the propaganda machine that could mobilize these groups again to go on mass strikes and mutiny against their commanding officers and so on and so forth because they do have some worker and soldier representation. Whether or not they could have done that, I, I suppose the threat worked a little bit and slowly but surely the provisional government is forced to um, recognize um, at least the gravity of the Petrograd Soviet in terms of dual power. Uh, uh, they end up meeting, these two groups end up meeting in the uh, Tauride Palace too, um, the same building where the new government was beginning to take shape. The Menshevik leaders of the Soviet believed that Russia was not quite ready for socialism, thus kind of revealing they're a little bit more conservative than the Bolsheviks. So the Mensheviks are like, cool, we're slowly changing rough. They're reformers. They're reformers. They're not revolutionaries. They're reformers, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. And they don't think that Russia is ready for full-blown socialism. And even though I want to be the more radical radical like guy that can look back a hundred years later and be like, ah, you guys were weak because you weren't in, 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 in reality, maybe they were right. Like the Soviet union maybe wasn't ready for a full blown, like, like socialist change. It wasn't industrialized. It was mostly peasants. Um, they were still dealing with the ramifications of world war one. Maybe they were right. I, I don't want to say they're right. Cause I want to be like gung ho radical, but like, what do you think? I mean, hindsight's always 2020, right? Like the issues you just said, we know now, right, they weren't industrialized enough, there wasn't an mass production to support all of the people and so forth, but they, who knows what would have happened, right, if they had won out, you know, I don't know. Well, and, and, and maybe some of them were a little bit more pure in their Marxist thought that Marxism would argue that a full-blown capitalist economy is necessary first to set both the material and ideal conditions for the socialist transition. Right. And Russia had clearly never gone through any real capitalist period. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe they were right in that regard. So their idea, the Menshevik idea, was to introduce extensive democratic reform in Russia, um, basically create a republic, not unlike some of their allies like England or France or the United States, um, uh, actually advocate for civil rights at the time, um, abolish religious and ethnic discrimination, things that we would consider, again, just kind of like liberal agenda today, they argue that that slower process was the way to set things up for a full-blown socialist government. Anyway, uh, again, the more radical side of me is like, oh man, they just do it all, just blow it all up. But in reality, blowing it all up didn't work either. So maybe the Mensheviks were right all along. I don't know. A debate, again, maybe for a future uh, podcast. Okay. In terms of the other side of this provisional government, the Duma had numerous shortcomings as well. Um, and they could see that the Soviet national development was actually a plan more people were, for better or worse, gravitating towards. The All-Russian Central Executive Committee of Soviets had been established. That's a long title, basically, for a more formalized, like, national version of the Petrograd Soviet. Soviet. So the Petrograd Soviet still exists. I'm not saying it goes away, but basically they're, they're, they, they also then create another committee called the All-Russian Central Executive Committee of Soviets. If there's not anything more like, like, like Marxist than creating bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake, this, like, this is yeah. it right here. Another committee. Another committee. We need another committee to oversee the other committee right. that's talking about committees regarding committees. Um, anyway. They undermine the authority of both the provisional government and the socialist. Um, this is where a very famous um, provisional government official named Alexander Kerensky really kind of steps into the uh, the lion's den. He essentially seeks to bridge the gap between like the Petrograd Soviet, this new organization of Soviets, and the Duma. Um, he is he would call himself a socialist, but working in the provisional government. So maybe one of the more conservative socialists one might imagine. He eventually is the prime minister of said Duma, um, and he did push for some very important reforms in Russia, like freedom of speech. He released political prisoners, um, but the one thing that made him wildly unpopular is that he continued the war effort. So if we re reflect back on that earlier discussion I talked about regarding some of the splits in the left, one of them is pro-World War I or anti-World War I. He was pro-World War I. He thought Russia should remain in the war, and that made him wildly unpopular because they were still dealing with heavy military losses on the front lines and numerous soldiers on the front lines just started to defect. They just started to leave the war front. They wouldn't even go home. They would just like go, go into like basically surrender to the Germans. Um, so this was a big problem that they were dealing with. The Bolsheviks, on the other hand, are starting to gain a little bit of steam. They are led, of course, by the aforementioned uh, Vladimir Lenin, and they seize the opportunity of some of the unpopular measures of the Kerensky provisional government and some of the divides that are also taking place in the 
the Petrograd Soviet. Uh, Germany arranged for Lenin to pass through their tor- territory to get home. Keep in mind, he was in Bern, Switzerland, and even though Switzerland <laughs> is always kind of neutral, um, to get to um, to get to Russia, he had to go through German territory, and they're like, cool, dude, go. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is kind of like an obvious question, but I'll ask it anyway. Why would Germany want Lenin going back to uh, Russia? Because they want him to go start a revolution. And thus, that's... Or finish one, I Yeah, guess. finish a revolution. I said, yeah, he's not starting yeah. anything. Like, that is a common misconception. Even the the most, like, wild Leninists out there, you have to admit this. Dude basically just co-ops a process that was already taking place. He, like, that's... Yeah, it was already going down before Lenin shows up. He's going to show up and take credit. And we're going to show you how. All right. Lenin ends up traveling on a sealed train. On his way, he writes the April Theses, where the Soviets essentially take power. The most famous slogan of the time, all power goes to the Soviets, um, takes place in these April Theses. He denounces the liberals in the provisional government, and he forbids cooperation with it. Uh, To give a brief preview of some of these theses, I think it is important that we read a few of them. Um, so he says in his introduction, I published these personal theses of mine with only the briefest explanatory notes, which were developed in far greater detail in the report. And then he goes on in number one, he says in our attitude towards the war, which under the new provisional government of Lvov and company unquestionably remains on Russia's part, a predatory imperialist war owing to the capitalist nature of that government, not the slightest concession to revolutionary defensivism is pr- defensism is permissible. The class conscious proletariat can give its consent to a revolutionary war, which would really justify revolutionary defensism only on condition A, that the power passed to the proletariat and the poorest sections of the peasants aligned with the proletariat, and B, that all annexations must be renounced in deed and not in word, and C, that a complete break be affected in actual fact with all capitalist interests." This is essentially a pretty big, like, demand, more or less. Basically saying, like, the only conditions for war are wars against capitalism. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying it, but that's essentially what he's saying. And since World War I is clearly not a war against capitalism, but more or less a war for capitalism, he would be arguing that this war can no longer continue. And it's not in the interests of the proletariat by any means. And whether or not he felt this deep in his bones is irrelevant. There were so many soldier mutinies and defections. This immediately won him favor with all of those those vets of the war or soldiers like this. I mean, this that's why it's his first like theses. Like he mm. knew this. These were the people I need on my side. Um, and he may have really felt in his bones that the war was unjustified. And that's fine if he really did. But like this was also clearly political strategy. The second thesis regarding like fraternization is also kind of important. He says the specific feature of the pe- present situation in Russia is that the country is passing from the first stage of the revolution, which owing to the insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletariat placed power in the hands of the bourgeoisie to its second stage, which must place power in the hands of the proletariat and the poorest sections of the peasants. So again, he's watching from basically Switzerland and saying like, so, okay, cool. February revolution, Merely took the power from the autocracy and gave it to the liberals. Now we're going to take that next step. Mm-hmm. So, in the, I mean, he's observing correctly, clearly. Right. Um, okay. Um, but he says this peculiar situation demands of us an ability to adapt ourselves to the special conditions of party work among unprecedentedly large masses of proletarians who have just awakened to political life. This is the low key way of saying the masses are too dumb to know what they're doing and we need to basically take over for them. This is where these ideas of intelligentsia and eventually like revolutionary vanguard really begin to take hold. And at this point, there's probably no better opportunity to just have this discussion with you um, what are your thoughts on his idea of a revolutionary vanguard? Even though it's does it, that term doesn't appear here in the April theses, this is something that is important. Basically, he's saying, cool, we need the unwashed masses to lead the revolution through like blood, like they need to be the one making sacrifices, but us really smart, important people need to be the ones basically directing the revolutionary process. And when it's all done, we're going to be the ones that take all of the credit and basically direct the nature of the country. I would argue there's nothing less socialist than that, but that's just my opinion. What are your thoughts on this idea of a revolutionary ban- vanguard and intelligentsia? I mean, I'll argue do the pro-vanguard opinion just for the sake of argument, right? He, the, the argument goes that not everyone has time to dive into theory and to spend their lives being full-time revolutionaries and really understand the economics and politics and so forth 
the dynamics that are going on and apply theory to that for a successful revolution. So Leninists argue that we must have essentially this class of professional revolutionaries that can do that and inform the actions of the masses who are the revolutionary vanguard. Of course, this opens up uh, co-optation and exploitation by the revolutionary vanguard, corruption and so forth. That's possible. Well, and Ed, as consistent liter- listeners of our ch- uh, uh, channel and subscribers will know that we uh, have a lot of episodes more on anarchist theory, and, and it would probably behoove us to say we definitely, at least theoretically, lean that way. And this is why we have the biggest issue with this like revolution right here is, and this is one of the biggest debates on the left between like socialists and anarchists, is like the vehicle for revolution. And an anar- anarchist would never agree to any formation of a new state strata. Like mm-hmm. that right there undermines all of like what you're trying to build. If you start from a point of uh, uh, essentially like, yeah, if you start from a point of hierarchy, that hierarchy is never going to go away. And to be blunt, the Soviet Union is a is a hallmark example of that. The hierarchy never went away. In fact, it just further stratified society for lack of a better term. Like, I don't know. That's my opinion on the matter. But this is like the biggest like to be brunt, blunt, hypocrisy within the socialist discourse. Mm-hmm. That this is the, this is my personal sticking point right here. Okay, um, moving on. The third April theses that Lenin argued for, no provisional government. The utter falsity of all its promises should be made clear, particularly of those relating to the renunciation of annexations, exposure in place of the impermissible impermissible illusion breeding demand that this government, a government of capitalists, should cease to be an imperialist government. So he's arguing that all power should go to the Soviets, essentially, that very famous phrase. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to skip a few of these, but I think this one is very important, number five. He says they are not creating a parliamentary republic. To return to a parliamentary republic from the Soviet of workers' deputies would be a retrograde step. But a republic of Soviets of workers, agricultural laborers, and peasants' deputies throughout the country from top to bottom. So he's basically saying that the only republican form of government that will exist is a basically representation through these various Soviets, these various unions. That is that it's not going to be a bunch of political bureaucrats, which eventually he is in a way. But regardless, he's arguing that's not what they want. Okay, he also argues that there will be abolition of the police, the army and the bureaucracy. That's kind of fire. What do you think of that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, he said the salaries of all officials, all of whom are elective and displaceable at any time, not to exceed the average wage of a competent worker. And he goes on and on. I think number six is interesting. I'll only include part of number six. He says, confiscation of all landed estates. I love this one because it shows like, I mean, it shows just so much co-optation. The landed estates were already already confiscated. Like the, the peasants had already basically like seized these means of productions. And he's like, he shows up and he's like, oh yeah, do that. Keep doing that. Just do what you're already doing. Like, mm-hmm. the, like it's, it's, it's kind of funny in that regard. All right. Anyway, off of the April theses, just know that they were some of the more famous um, immediate writings of him, like revealing his co-optation of the revolutionary processes that were already um, underway in Russia. Okay. The language in this, uh, in these April theses was powerful, but real actual like political power to the Soviet itself came very slowly. We might even argue that we're we're not even sure the Soviets, the various unions, were even prepared to actually hold power when workers themselves had already flipped power in the summer of 1917. So again, I must stress this, soldiers had already mutinied. Peasants were already seizing landed estates. Industrial workers had already taken control of the factories and the Soviets were essentially the unions that were supposed to be like organized to like basically like consolidate this power were perhaps not even ready to deal with the true ramifications of power. They had not set up like the communication lines. They had not set up the structures necessary to make things run smoothly, to get everybody fed, um, to like basically reemploy all of these soldiers in whatever capacity was necessary. So it's actually a mess. It's an absolute mess in this transitional period. So it's kind of interesting to think about. One last order to the front eventually like seals the deal between February and October. And that was like the government lies that were taking place in the Duma. Uh, a radical movement that wasn't necessarily fully aligned with the um, the Soviets themselves were the Kronstadt sailors, deserving of their own episode, probably not by us. I think you can find some other really well done shorties on YouTube about the Kronstadt sailors. We're not gonna make one, um, but please, by all means, look them up. The radical Kronstadt sailors end up showing up to the revolutionary process between 
February and October as well. Um, and they end up like helping mostly like their fellow like quote unquote like soldiers or men of like like men in uniform or whatever and executing a lot of like these like officers that they found in hiding including even like one admiral and when i say they show up like they're sailors like they, they show up on the rivers themselves like it, running through saint petersburg right so um lenin um excuse me they also take to the the streets chanting all powers to the soviets so at least i guess in 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 this part of the revolution, I, I guess I would be, I should be remiss in saying they weren't necessarily aligned with the Soviets. They won't be soon, but at least at this part, they were aligned with the Soviets. Lenin ends up um, fleeing during this period of time um, back to Finland under the threat of arrest by the provisional government while Trotsky himself was actually arrested. So it's interesting that he shows up talking a big game with these April theses and then like runs back away to Finland because the government still has enough power to arrest him. Um, and again, Trotsky ends up arrested. The, this takes place in July. These are called the July days. And they confirm the populism, though, of the Bolsheviks. Because when Lenin flees and Trotsky is arrested, they're almost like martyred uh, in the movement. And the call for their return to public life is like loud. Loud among peasants, loud among soldiers, and loud among workers. Um, which is important. Anyway, um, the growth of like the um, the movement in Petrograd specifically grows. It had it had peaked at two hundred fifty thousand during like the Women's Day marches, and it had shrunk back down by July to about twenty four thousand of people on protest. It ends up getting back up to about two hundred thousand people on constant protest by uh, fall of that year of nineteen seventeen. And this is where we get the very famous Kornilov affair. Which, long story short, it's when a general Kornilov sends troops back to the capital, where Alexander Kerensky and the provisional government essentially needs the Bolshevik Red Guard to fend off a coup. So it looks really bad for the provisional government. They're like threatening like Soviet leaders, but then like when the actual army, like a, a loyalist army like shows back up, they're like, oh, Soviets, please send like your new Red Guard to help us out. Um, um, keep us protected from this coup. It makes the Kerensky government look really weak. Power should be seized in both St. Petersburg and Moscow simultaneously, simultaneously is what is decided by the Bolsheviks. They're like, look, this is an opportunity. Lenin sees this. He's like, look, the, the Kerensky government can threaten me with like arrest. And I ran away to, to Finland. They can even arrest Trotsky. But at this point now, they're asking for our help to defend themselves from like um, the people that still remain loyal to the to 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 the Romanovs for whatever reason they remain loyal. So at this point, there's no better time to strike than now. They need us. We don't need them. We're going to seize power simultaneously in St. Petersburg and Moscow. So this leads to, of course, the most famous part of the revolution, the October Revolution, better known as Red October. It is less sporadic than the February Revolution. It is uh, probably better planned and better coordinated. Um, most argue that it was Leon Trotsky's organization and direction of the Red Guard that led to the revolution since Lenin wasn't even around. He's in Finland chilling. Um, so anyway, this is, again, where the Trotskyists kind of found a lot of their, um, their backing of not just like his philosophies, but the fact that he was a dude that really got shit done. Okay. There was also uh, German help via some key agents to include even Alexander Parvis, who was hanging out with the Germans a little bit. Anyway, on October 24th, Alexander Kerensky and his troops shut down all far left, like Bolshevik wing newspapers and fighting ensues. The Bolsheviks end up liberating some of these newspapers, like the actual places where the newspapers are, are produced. And Kerensky then moves to limit access by raising like all the bridges and battles uh, begin to follow. Why would Kerensky specifically target like where newspapers are produced to like shut down? Like, why was that like a a strategy that he chose? It stops the spreading of information, the propaganda machine. It's also symbolic of like, this is your information, right? The revolution. And then obviously raising all of the bridges, again, rivers flowing through like Petrograd, wildly important. Okay. A military revolutionary committee is formed, organizes the Red Guard, again, under the tutelage of Leon Trotsky. Um, he plays a major role there. They seize in con... Um um, yeah, I was about to say in conflict, in contrast, whatever. In response, they end up seizing the Petrograd Telegraph and then lowering all of the bridges for the free flow of not just like people and goods, but information as well. A flotilla comes down the river of the Red Guard, like so like these boats, like of like Red Guard, like soldiers now arrives as well. And these aren't like just like... 
These aren't like, you know, fishing boats. There's five destroyers on this flotilla, like floating through Petrograd at this point in time. Um, and this appeals to like, like the militarization of the revolution right here. It hasn't been like super militant, even though soldiers have been involved. It's mostly them either like throwing down their arms or redistributing their arms. This is like a militant part. Like again, you're in, you're in Petrograd and you see these like five destroyers just like roll up on the river. Like this is a little bit more of the militant part of the revolution. The Kronstadt Stalers themselves end up joining in on the fun. They're, of course, on the river as well. And the Petrograd garrison also officially changes sides. So the Petrograd garrison had been answering to the Duma basically from February to October. They're like, look, the writing's on the wall. We're now going to work with the Red Guard as well. And you can just kind of see, like the, like, the provisional government's just basically done at this point in time. Um, Lenin ends up seizing the day where, of course, he writes um, the very famous publication or the speech to the citizens of Russia claiming the official overthrow of the provisional government. I'm going to stress at this point, like, what's Lenin, like, really done? Like, I, I don't know. In terms of, like, the revolutionary process, again, this isn't, I'm not trying, like, I, I'm not trying to, like, demean him, like, too much, but, like, it's like, I don't know, man. This is what he had to say to the citizens of Ru Russia. The provisional government has been deposed. State power has passed into the hands of the organ of the Petrograd Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies, the Revolutionary Military Committee, which heads the Petrograd proletarian and the garrison. The cause for which the people have fought, namely the immediate offer of a democratic peace, the abolition of landed pro uh, proprietorship, workers' control over production, and the establishment of Soviet power, this cause has been secured. Long live the revolution of workers, soldiers, and peasants. Revolution military committee of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, um, written on October 25th of 1917, approximately at 10 a.m. Um, I don't know. Again, it's short and sweet. Any thoughts on him basically saying to all of Russia, um, like, we won? I, I, I don't I mean, know. It's, yeah, it's the declaration, right, of the success of the revolution. But why not, like, Trotsky or something? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. On October 26th, the next day, um, cut off, uh, uh, they cut off communication, transportation, and a mass insurgency is followed, and they end up being surrounded by the Red Guard. Excuse me, the Red Guard ends up surrounding like the remaining provisional government. Um, they're surrounded by workers and sailors, and eventually they show up at the Winter Palace as well, and the Winter Palace eventually just like relents bloodlessly. It's not like some storming of the Winter Palace, like the Bastille or anything like that. It's, it's bloodless. So the Winter Palace just basically collapses, um, and Alexander Kerensky bounces he leaves um, and he'll come back into play a little bit later um, there would also be a little bit of propaganda produced on this very famous event produced by the Soviet Union itself, itself. in fact in 1920 a um, overtly grand theatrical production called The Storming of the Winter Palace was produced. It was like a play that basically made it look like much more dramatic than it was. Basically, like, again, this is important in terms of creating uh, this term we always use, an ethically constitutive story for the foundation of what would become the Soviet Union. The Storming of the Winter Palace is like one of those over-romanticized events that really wasn't all that influential in regards to the revolution, but we, like, turn it into this event. It's just like the Boston Tea Party, completely inconsequential to, like, anything, but oh my god we've romanticized the shit out of it mm -hmm. this storming of the winter palace would be a soviet version of that so anyway in terms of uh creating immediate legitimacy a second congress of soviets was established in november um so the next month where 670 delegates met 300 of which um identified as bolshevik transferred power to three soviets Soviet of workers, Soviet of soldiers, and Soviet of peasants, and their deputies, which basically means their representatives. So these are going to be the three main Soviets, um, again, represented by these deputies, workers, soldiers, and peasants. Thoughts on those being the three identifiers of the main Soviets? I, I always think that it's interesting to divide the workers and the peasants. It's just reflective of kind of the material and ideological circumstances of Russia at the time. Right. I mean, they're both the masses, right? So to divide them, to create division in them from, quote unquote, the get-go, it was, it was always interesting to me. Yeah, and of course, Maoism would take a, a different turn on this later on mm -hmm. um, in the 20th century. Okay, the Mensheviks and the moderates at this second Congress of Soviets would actually walk out at some of these proposals. They would just flat out walk out. And this is what Trotsky had to say about them, them walking out. He says, you're pitiful, isolated individuals. You're bankrupts. Your role is played out. Go where you belong from now on into the dustbin of history. I love the fact that he said played out in like 1917 yeah. or whatever. Like you're played out. Like, like I love that. I love that about Trotsky. Anyway, it's just- this 
is also people. like I randomly the dustbin of history is exactly. also yeah it's like a huge term now that like he didn't actually invent but his use of it right there is like people point to it as like that's the source of this saying that gets used all the time right um and again these translations he did not say this in english so played out might not have been the exact way it came out in russian but in all the translations i've seen that's how people are translating it into english so anyway i'm going with it straight fire um trotsky is a g okay uh, critics, critics of what was going on at the second Congress. Um, the Bolsheviks gained only 24% of the vote yet somehow won. Um, this is where some of that backdoor politicking and perhaps even intimidation were taking place for a lot of the Bolshevik me measures to eventually get passed, especially with only winning 20%, 24% of the votes. Um, history dictates that there was heavy urban support for the Bolsheviks, mostly, of course, in Moscow and Petrograd, whereas the rural, like the peasants, were a little bit more split. They were a little bit more split mm -hmm. between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks and so on and so forth. So, um, which is important. In terms of actually getting to work, now that the revolution is like dying down, revolutionary politics and military victories lead to Lenin's official set of decrees. So he is able to create the decree on peace, which basically was important. And we will give Lenin credit, even though I've been a little bit critical of Lenin, we must give him credit here for following through on his promises. He basically yanked Russia right out of World War I um, to end the imperial war. He uh, issues calls to soldiers and all workers of the world to to stop fighting for your imperialist powers. This wasn't just to like Russians. He does what he says. He has the power to now take basically the Russian military out of World War One. He doesn't have the power to do that for Germany or or, or England or, or the United States or whoever else is fighting in the war still. But he does it here. He also calls on those soldiers themselves to stop fighting. Like, what are you fighting for? You guys are literally dying over the color of your uniform and the stupid ass flag that you fly under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want more on this, we have an entire like shorty on nationalism in World War One and how just obtuse it is to literally like kill and die for these like nationalist causes. Excuse me if I'm offending anybody. Actually, don't excuse me. I hope I am offending people here. Like what a dumb reason. Like I'm going to kill you because you live in a different country and you have slightly different beliefs. Mm -hmm. Like absolutely. But unless, like, it's, unless it's Christmas and we'll play football together. Yeah. And we like to romanticize that story between like the Germans and the French or is it the Germans and the British. I don't remember. I think it's the Germans and the French. We like to like romanticize that story, but like, yeah, they got back to killing each other like the next day. Yeah. Like it's, it just proves how, like you said this, how ridiculous it is. Yeah. I, the I, one I, day you're killing each other, the next day you're smoking and eating and playing soccer together. And the next day you're back to killing each other. Just, in the most disturbing and inhumane yeah. ways, like no man's land, like just laying people out with like machine gun fire and the barbed wire and the sarin gas and the mustard gas and the what's the one that smells like pineapples I forget which one that is but whatever no they said like if you like hear the one of them smelled like pineapples or something like that I forget which one that was and the the mark 7 tanks and the the bombers and just it's just absolutely ridiculous but anyway that's that's a whole different story so okay um he does get Russia out of the war they signed the treaty of Brest uh Litovsk uh, with the Germans. This is an important treaty um, in terms of taking Russia out of the war. It's not a treaty where like we're friends with Germany, but basically we're saying we're done fighting. It's also important um, for colonialism that deserves its own episode. And it's also actually been used in other episodes that we've done on like colonial processes. But this treaty is actually wildly important for like nation states in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, because at, th at this point where like essentially the Soviet Union um, for all its faults, at least under Lenin, was wildly passionate about ending colonialism. And so this treaty then allows them to start publishing all the backdoor treaties the Allies were making for carving up things like the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and what their real plans for Africa was. The, the Soviets begin just like saying, like, these... Don't believe the Allies, don't believe the Brits, don't believe the French, don't believe the Americans. They may argue that they're liberators, but this is really them just designing how they're going to carve up the world for their favor now. Mm -hmm. So this was actually, again, giving Lenin a lot of credit here on this one. Okay. He also issued the decree on land, which again is kind of already just taking credit for what was already transpiring. Private property would be nationalized. The banks would be nationalized. Bank accounts would be expropriated. The church property would be expropriated and all foreign debt would be canceled. All factories would be given to the Soviets. Wages would be fixed with raises and limited, limiting all labor to eight hours a day. This is actually pretty powerful as well. And we will give Lenin some credit here. So private property would be nationalized. Real 
quickly before we go any further for listeners that are not familiar with our content and are immediately going to want to comment about, I don't want to share my toothbrush and my t-shirt. Uh, Kanyeism sucks. Like, I can't wait to hear that in the comments. Um, what do they really mean by private property? It's not your toothbrush. It's not your shirt. It's not your bed. What is private property? Capital assets. Anything they can be used to exploit is how I explain it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like by you owning a toothbrush, like that doesn't you can't exploit someone else with that pro- amount of property or right. type of property. That right? is not it's the private property that the communists are going to make you share. And, yes. Yeah. So okay. So yes, private property would be nationalized. The other part I want to pick on here, um, church par- property would be expropriated. This was a little more controversial. I'm cool with it because like whatever. Like religions have been ex- exploiting people like for like thousands of years. So I have no no sympathy or empathy for for any of the religious institutions myself. But there are a lot of true believers in Russia, and this would alienate a lot of them by basically like limiting the power of the church. Mm -hmm. Um, And it would actually have a more profound impact than in Russia, in the Soviet Union, what would become the Soviet Union than it did in France. When France kind of alienated, when the French Revolution kind of alienated the Catholic Church, yes, there was like blowback from the Pope and some French citizens, but most French citizens were like, cool, let's do this. In Russia, it's going to be a little bit different. There are a lot stronger um, practitioners, apparently, of Eastern Orthodoxy during the Russian Revolution than there were um, French Catholics. Any thoughts as to why that might be? Why the the seizing of church power during the Russian Revolution was more controversial than the seizing of Catholic power um, or sub- subordinating of Catholic power? I mean, during like the French you Revolution? talked about at the beginning, right? The Eastern Orthodox Church was such so ingrained into Russian culture. I think it was much more influential than the Catholicism in France at the time. Even though, like, I don't want to minimize the role of the right. church in France. Like, it was incredibly influential, but I would say not on the same level as Eastern Orthodoxy in Russia. Other straight fire part of the decree on land, canceling foreign debt. Basically, if Russia was in debt to one of the imperial powers, UK, US, France, whoever they were in debt to, no, nope, not in debt anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, you didn't pay us back. Yeah, but we just don't even believe in that system of economy anymore. So right. it's just not a thing. It's not a thing in our world. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And actually, that, that's it's it's not just that I love it for like just the giant middle finger it gives like the imperial powers around the world, but because it's actually just useful. Anybody could do this. Mm-hmm. You and I could do this. Like we could just do this. We could just be like, well, banks, I don't believe in your system of exploitation anymore. You're just not going to get my assets anymore. Um, now, obviously, the laws would always bank the, back the banks in this, but um, let's say, I don't know, half the population does it. All of a sudden, no, the, the banks have no more say-so. Mm-hmm. Why are we so powerless in this regard? That's, it's a rhetorical question. Right. We cannot get into that right now, but like, I just love it. I love it. If all, if all people with degrees, for example, in the United States were just like, I'm not paying back my student loan, like, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Like, what is the government going to do? What is, I don't even know who the lenders are. Chase, Manhattan, Fannie Mae, I don't even know. Who are the lenders that, that hold those debts? Mm-hmm. What are they going to do? Oh, I mean, most, yeah, whatever. The majority of them are the federal government, which is a whole other problem. Yeah, what are you, but what are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. You, you're going to show up on everybody's door with like, like I don't know, like yeah. a you know, National Guard or cops or the army? Like I mean, there's a whole, such a whole yeah. other episode, the, the importance of credit right. scores and so forth. But yeah. If you just stop participating, like, what are they going to do? Okay, anyway, that's what that's what Lenin did on a global economy level. He basically just stopped participating, and I love that. Okay, other things that he did, um, things that have been working in places like England on a, like, more reform level um, to work days, fixing wages, giving people raises, giving power to the unions to run their own factories, and, of course, guaranteeing eight-hour work days. So in this regard, we must give... As much as I criticized Lenin in the first part of the episode, we'll give him a little bit of credit here for at least following through on the promises and demands um, that had already been set forth. The Mensheviks end up fleeing during this time period. The government, they end up seizing um, one of the smaller, um, like, um, satellite states of Russia, for lack of a better term, Georgia. Um, And uh, ironically, where, where Joseph Stalin's from, but we'll... We'll uh, talk about him um, in the future. Okay. Anyway, meanwhile, during this period of time, Alexander Kerensky makes his way back to the government with uh, a regiment of Cossack soldiers, um, and he ends up firing on um, other soldiers where eight die in Petrograd itself, which makes himself into an enemy of the people. It ends up being his quote-unquote fatal blunder because essentially you're now firing. You're like, you're saying you're working for the people, but you're firing on the people. It's a bad look for Kerensky, and he forever kind of like loses his... He was already like... the downward decline of having like a good name during the revolution but this is his fatal blunder it reminds me a little bit of again if we're going to use like revolutionary comparison of the marquis de lafayette and how he kind of loses his good name in the french revolution a little bit himself okay 
The Red Guard ends up defeating these Cossacks um, at the Battle of Zarskoy Selo. I hope I, again, um, um, Zarskoy Selo, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, Moscow ends up pretty bloody, bloody during this like brief like reinvigoration of violence. 700 people die in Moscow. Um, but it does result in Bolsheviks seizing like permanent power in Moscow. The assembly ends up creating the citizens of the Russian Republic during this period of time, which is important because it abolishes all former titles, estates, and ranks in seeking at least socioeconomic equality and to remove the power of another like Alexander Kerensky showing up with some weird title and being like, just follow me troops. So this was eventually them like that, their response to that. All right, the Bolsheviks end up dissolving the Consti Constituent Assembly in 1918 amid much infighting between moderates and radicals, and all army hierarchy is eliminated. So all of this is taking place like relatively quickly after the revolution. So there would be no ranking, there would be no salutes. Now, obviously, this will change later when the Soviet Union establ formally establishes the Red Army, but momentarily, this stuff is kind of gone. A, and this is now when Lenin gets controversial again for a lot of like uh, leftist thinkers. This is also when the Cheka would be established. Um, they are formed uh, after the assassination attempt on Lenin himself, on Lenin's head. Um, the Cheka would be, of course, a secret police force. It is just another example of immediate policing of the revolution after the revolutionary processes. They would go on to inflict what would become known as the Red Terror on Russian citizens, maybe taking lessons from Robespierre if we want to make another comparison here, um, or the CDCs of Castro, although they come along later, so they couldn't have taken inspiration from them. Um, the revolutionary guard of the Iranian revolution we've talked about before. Um, real quickly, again, for what is this, the sixth or seventh time I've asked you, why do revolutions always form secret police forces to enforce the revolution? Why do they always do this? I mean, we like to say that it's... After they've already won, yeah. quote unquote, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they would argue it's to ensure the success and continuation of the revolution to make sure that they can be protected from any insurgents that would threaten the revolution. Fair enough. In 1918 also is when the popular adoption of the hammer and sickle as the symbol of the revolution take place. And of course, it is one of the most famous symbols to this day. Um, it, I mean, whatever. I don't even need to describe it. Everyone knows what the hammer and sickle of the Soviet Union is um, because it is so successful. But what I do want to talk about is why symbolism is important for the revolution. Like, uh, real quickly, again, I'm going to ask the sociologist here, like, the symbolism of the hammer and sickle is, is kind of, like, understood. But, like, why is symbolism? symbolism so important in terms of creating longevity of the revolutionary ideal and building nationalism. We talked about it with the French tricolor during the French Revolution. Um, we uh, kind of dabbled in it a little bit regarding some of the mythos behind the American War for Independence, but like the role of symbolism. It's just a flag, man. It's just yeah. a red piece of cloth with a yellow hammer and a yellow sickle on it, but but it becomes so much more than that. Well, it's just such such a key point of creating solidarity. Uh, a symbol that people can be unified behind that represents, even if it's not perfectly right, that functions to represent what they stand for and what they mean and a key part of their identity. I, I mean, it's so powerful that when I teach anything related to this in class, usually I'm doing like Marxist theory or whatever, and I mentioned that like the hammer and sickle came about really came to represent just blanket communism in the Russian revolution. They're like, well, I thought Karl Marx like invented the hammer and sickle. I mean, it's just so like the story, the symbol is so powerful that it's like this myth on its own. You know? Yeah. I mean, the synthesis of workers and peasants and, and, like labor, like there's just a lot of meaning there. So mm -hmm. somebody, and a lot of people think of Lenin, and his propaganda team as like the master like marketers of the mm -hmm. early 20th century like even it's kind of funny to, to call them that as anti-capitalist but a lot of like marketing firms like point to this era as like inspirational this is how you create a social movement mm -hmm. they were such masters of propaganda and and you could see it even through something as simple as the symbolism of a flag yep. they were masters at creating like meaning um that was much more than because they had to like Think about it this way. When we did the American War for Independence back in the Myth as America series, it took literally decades, close to a century, to consolidate power under a federal government, especially when we take the Civil War into account, mm -hmm. because, like, there was just so much, like, 
difference of opinion on what a government should look like and states rights versus federal rights and slavery versus not slavery, well, you know, and, and, and what to do with indigenous populations and so on and so forth. Like they, they were not good at this to be blunt. Like right. even right after the American war for independence, I'm a Virginian. What's an American? I'm a New Yorker. What's an American? Not, not true here. Well, and like, yeah, even like so many people point to like the American war for independence. So many people in America anyways, that like, this is the first real like propaganda and like the Sam Adams and like so forth. But like we talked about, it's really the French. They, they yeah, really, so pamphleteering was huge in the American war for independence, yeah. but like it wasn't convincing the people, right? They still had to conscript the revolutionary army. Yeah. Then France takes it to another level where they're actually about the masses, right? And the whole idea of the public sphere and so forth. Then it's Russia that I think takes it, like you just said, to the next level where they're just so good at it that they can just whip people into a fervor like overnight. Right? And maybe and the, they're even better at it than the French because the French actually did really try and take the people into account. I'm not so sure that the Soviets really tried true. to take the people into account. So their mm-hmm. propaganda was more just like, would we call it indoctrination or socialization? Which one do you want? I mean, where do we draw the line? Yeah, the exactly. Two? So yeah. maybe that's why the Soviets were a little bit more efficient than the French. So like the French were probably the really good at it and maybe best intentioned, I would say. Um, uh, U.S. is probably not so much good or even best intentioned. Russia, really good at it, not well intentioned. Um, so yeah. Anyway, there we go. That's our opinion on it. That's opinion. We'll always say what it's on our opinion. I'm not teaching that as fact right now. That's opinion. But anyway, go ahead. Finishing up the revolutionary process is the Russian Civil War. I am going to do this super fast. It is four years of a very important war. I am not, we're more talking about the Russian Revolution here, but I do at least need to mention that the Russian Civil War is like the consolidation of basically the revolutionary power. So it is important, and I need to at least make short mention of it, even though I'm not going to go in depth of battles and so on and so forth. Um, But it is. It's basically the reason that the Soviets are able to secure power. It's kind of interesting that counter-revolutionary forces, when they fail, are the ones that really consult, that really like seal the deal for themselves. Like when you go in as the white army here and the allies to include like the Brits and the French and the Americans and stuff, and you basically like lose this war, that basically gives the people all the all the answer they need that, oh man, we should be part of the Soviets. Like we're going to let the Soviets do what they want. So it's kind mm-hmm. of these backfire every time. They backfired mm-hmm. in the Iranian revolution. They backfired with the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. Like they always backfire with these like kind of like outside like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Instigators, the, these, these outside instigators looking to like destabilize the country after a revolution. They, they backfire yeah, they more than they works. work. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Okay. And that's what the Russian Civil War was about. So the Workers and Peasants Red Army is formed under the leadership of Leon Trotsky. It comes from the fo- former volunteer Red Guard, the Cheka, and covert imperialists to basically defend the revolution from... The White Army, the very famous White Army, which was a loose confederation of landowners, Republicans, not like the American version of Republican people that wanted a republic, more like the Duma, um, conservatives, monarchists, army generals, and non-Bolshevik socialists and democratic reformists. So the White Army is a confederation of basically everybody that doesn't want a Soviet Union. It's formed by forced conscription and foreign influence, and it's led by a general named uh, Udenich, Udenich, and an admiral named Kolchak and a general named uh, Denikin. Those are like the three most famous like leaders. But I must stress, like it's formed through forced conscription, whereas the Red Army ironically was not. Mm-hmm. Now later on, the Red Army during like World War II and definitely lots of conscription. But this OG Red Army was not, it was, it was volunteer. Yeah. The White Army's conscripted. We already know where the people's support lies. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there's also a third wing, which will be getting an upcoming episode in the very, very near future. Nick recommended we do it, and we are going to do it. I just need to do some more research on it. The black armies were also part of um, the Russian Civil War. To be blunt, these are straight up anarchists, some of them straight up revolutionary nihilists. We mentioned in our last episode on nihilism. They are willing to help the Red Army against the White Army just because they're more... um, ideologically um, um, aligned with the Red Army, no, but not fully aligned with the Red Army, but more so than they would be the White Army. So they're willing to help the Red Army at first. They, of course, are led by the very famous Nestor Machno, who, uh, again, I mentioned in the uh, last Nihilism episode, but again, they're going to get their own episode here very shortly. So there's like really like three main armies working here, the Red Army, the White Army, and the Black Army. In terms of like the rest of the world, the West is now like piecing itself back together after World War I. It is also now consolidating its colonial holdings all around the world, doing awful things in, again, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, and the Middle East. And I am not being, I'm not exaggerating. They are doing awful things in all of those places. Oh, can't leave China off the map. 
uh, yeah, absolutely, in China as well. So anyway. Well, I think that, that just points to like when the rest of the world powers are being as colonial as possible. And like you said, committing atrocities, like to Lenin's credit, the Soviet Union just like bounces on all colonialism. It's yeah. like, we're, this isn't what we're about. Yeah. And well, the West, what it, what it sees happening in Russia is they're scared of possible alignments with like the former self central powers. They're pissed off that Lenin was canceling the debts I already mentioned. Um, and most importantly, they're scared of ideas. This is when the first Red Scare, the first mm -hmm. Red Scare had already kind of like started and kicked off, but this is like the first Red Scare era, or, or it's actually fresh off that first Red Scare era. So they're basically scared of these ideas of for lack of a better term, like sharing inequality, like mm -hmm. I like that's that that's super scary in the West apparently. Horrifying. Like oh it my still god, is. oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh I I can't just pass down generational wealth for like centuries, right? Uh, anyway, cool. It still is. Those ideas are still terrified. Too. Yeah, they were super scared of those ideas. Okay. Anyway, the West sent supplies, munitions, etc., to the White Army. Uh, eventually, they also formally attacked ports as well. Most people don't think of this when they think of the Russian Civil War, but literally the Allied powers actually had, like, boots on the ground uh, as part of this process and still lost. So um, do the math there. Uh, anyway, okay. This is also when the very famous execution of the imperial family takes place. This is a, is, is it a symbol execute, symbolic execution of the imperial family or a war tactic to undermine any gravity the white army might have or both? It's debatable, but on July 16th of 1918, after, of course, the Tsar's family was evacuated to, to, to Balsk in the Ural Mountains, um, they were then uh, later moved to Yekaterinburg. Terenburg, Yekaterinburg, um, and early in the morning. And this is where Nicholas, Alexandra, their children, their doctor, um, their servants were all taken into the basement and executed. They were just flat out executed. Um, there is uh, the possibility uh, via cartoon that one named Anastasia escaped. Um, but uh, we'll leave that to uh, DreamWorks. It wasn't Disney. It's DreamWorks. I don't even know. Anyway. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. The DreamWorks story is actually based on, on real mythology, but yeah. Anyway, where did the order to execute this family come from? Was it Lenin? Was it Trotsky? Um, was there no order at all? There is still debate, actually. To be blunt, no one's uncovered any orders from the top. So we can't necessarily blame the Lenins and Trotskys and later on the, the Stalins, if we want to, of the world for this execution. Um, and again, if we wanted to blame anybody, it wouldn't be that like, I mean, it wouldn't be that controversial to kill the, I mean, I don't like killing at all, but like the king and queen were killed during the French Revolution. We didn't, but the kids, like kids is like, man, you're, you're shooting kids and servants and stuff. Yeah, I mean, the argument clearly would be yeah. like the lineage of yeah. the divine right, et cetera, right? We have to eliminate everyone. In terms of the controversy, though, again, we don't, there's no, there's no, like, at least to, in my cursory research, I could not find a paper trail as to where this order came from, or if mm -hmm. it was just reactionary, because the town they ended up, like, fleeing to was a Bolshevik haven. It could have just been from there, just could, could have been a local execution. Um... It's also during this time, importantly, in uh, Lenin's um, lack of colonial, um, enterprise that Finland would formally secede um, from the Russian Empire, um, which is, is, is fine. Um, uh, Lenin didn't necessarily care. Uh, again, he was an anti-colonialist. But in contrast, two other places tried to secede and did not succeed in their secession. Um, Poland and the Baltic states, so Latvia, Lithuania, and uh, Estonia also tried to secede, and they did not succeed. They were not successful in their secession. Oh my God. Anyway, you know what I'm trying to spit out. So it's always kind of controversial there that for this like strong anti-colonialist mindset, in some regards, there were a couple of territorial sticking points for Lenin and mm -hmm. Poland and the Baltic states would remain those uh, through the 1990s, right? Like, and when they, they officially were able to win their independence, especially the Baltic states, Poland got its independence a little bit earlier, at least in name, we would argue it didn't really get its independence ever, but um. The mass geography of Russia further complicates the civil war, but in general, the whites found um, the rural uh, farmland more favorable to fight in, whereas the red army would fight in the urban areas. Um, and the black armies would fight mostly in non-ethnic Russia, uh, most predominantly in Ukraine, um, and the allies would stay on the periphery. So that's where everybody was most comfortable doing their fighting. Despite the aid, the red army and the people's support, whether real or manufactured by propaganda on reform, would prove way too much for the whites and the allies. 
guys, and um, they would wipe the floor with them. Eventually, they would see Siberia in 1922, effectively ending all military campaigns by the Red Army and all white resistance, allowing the Red Army to take control of what would now be called the Soviet Union or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, lots of attention would take place in terms of like military strategy in the Trans-Siberian Theater. Again, this is not the podcast or the episode for that. We're not going to talk about those military campaigns, but I did feel like I needed to give it a shout out for those of you that are into military history. Some cool things, I guess, took place in the Trans-Siberian um, Theater of War on this one. Um, the last gasp for the White Army was the Ayano uh, Majewski district, which was north of Krai, which contained a very important city of Vladivostok. Eventually, they gave up in 1923, and that's when it's like that's when it's like finally done. Um, okay, in terms of other like things going on during the Civil War, there were some minor um, counter revolutions. One of which, ironically, was by the Kronstadt sailors. It's called the Kronstadt Rebellion. They rebelled against the uh, Red Army. Um, and their rebellion was actually pretty effective. 10,000 Red Army soldiers died trying to put out the Kronstadt Rebellion. Um, so it was a pretty effective rebellion. Um, also, uh, Nestor Machno, who, again, we fondly talked about in a prior episode, and his Black Army would eventually also be crushed after their third refusal to basically be conscripted into the Red Army. Again, they are, they're anarchists and revolutionary nihilists. They had no interest in being part of the Red Army. Um, some might even argue uh, a few of them even though Makhno himself were also Ukrainian nationalists and they wanted an independent Ukraine. So that might be another reason they were crushed. Um, but of course, that's victory. What's the legacy? Um, what about, um, as I promised uh, probably over an hour ago at this point, what is the legacy when Lenin eventually dies? What, he dies a year after this is over in 1924. Uh, and then we have this debate, should it be Stalin? Should it be Trotsky? Um, like, what's the legacy? Uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, I, again, we could argue that, again, personally, our bias in this podcast would be things probably would have been better had Trotsky succeeded Lenin or uh, rather than Stalin, but uh, you will never know for sure. It's kind of yeah, a butterfly there's so effect. There's so many like, global variables. I didn't right, even right. really, I guess, dig into the history of Stalin here. Yeah. And I'm not going to now because I'm, I'm wrapping this thing up. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> but yeah. Plus, like, what would how would World War II have gone if Trotsky was in charge instead of Stalin? And like, there's so many global variables, it's impossible to like, hindsight right it's well and he ends up getting hunted down by the kgb in mexico right hanging out with frida Kahlo and uh, diego garcia um uh doing dope things down there but anyway um and then it's important like one note i always try to like tell my students when i'm talking about this is because they're always like well why didn't Lenin ever like institute actual socialism or communism and like why you know a he died a little too yeah quick. exactly yeah and b he only ever was in charge during times of war. Like the whole time that he's trying to do this, right? It's either World War One, which he quickly withdraws from, then a civil war. Like it's conflict at all times, right? right? There's never a time when it's just like, okay, we're chilling. Let's now try to put in this political and economic system, right? Is not a thing, right? And, but then, but also, we could argue, and I will argue that as 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 like both like pro and anti-Lenin we've tried to be in this in this episode and we've done both right we've tried to be like oh he did this well he did this shitty um the one thing we could say is he did set up the material conditions for a megalomaniac to take over mm -hmm. that's the unfortunate part of this and that's why Joseph Stalin was able to kind of like seize this um right. seize control um so and 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 that goes back to um something I said about halfway through this episode regarding like this is one of the reasons why um, I, I, the one thing, the one hang up I personally have with like the idea of a revolutionary vanguard and mm -hmm. an intelligentsia is you're setting the stage for, um, one individual like a Joseph Stalin, uh, like a chairman Mao, um, to completely co-opt the ideals of a revolution and just turn it into a different version, a more complicated version of a despotism. Mm -hmm. We could argue that there were certain socialist practices that would uh, be in the Soviet Union basically between, um, 1925 and whenever Stalin dies, I forget when it is, 1950 something, whatever it is. We could argue that there are like certain socialist parts of this but in reality like this was totalitarianism which well, and, like that's what the pro-stalinists argue right they're like there's already like democratic like processes in place and bureaucracy and the party and so forth that like stalin didn't actually even have that much power so he didn't really do anything right that's the argument i'm not buying it but yeah well and gulags gulags yeah. were a thing so anyway um and then like again the hunting down of your potential political adversaries that are, are still globally popular the trotsky's the trotsky's wife we talked about like i mean it's just 
like, yeah. Anyway, um, I mean, we could even like pontificate a little bit on how some of the ideals of of the original, the OG Marxist Leninism, are resurrected in the night, late fifties and, and early sixties. I don't even have the dates in front of me, but somebody can put it in the comments. When Khrushchev comes to power, like uh, you know, like Khrushchev actually tried to fix all the shit Stalin put the Soviet Union through. He's mm-hmm. not fondly remembered necessarily here in the States because of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but maybe he should be because it wasn't just Kennedy that dealt with it. It was Khrushchev that dealt with it as well. But um, but yeah, I mean, Khrushchev is, is, is one of those guys that, to be blunt, his main goal was to de-Stalinize the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. So um, the, reason, the only reason I'm adding Khrushchev to is something that shouldn't even be discussed in this podcast is because maybe he um, better exemplified Lenin's vision. Unfortunately, he... The cult of Stalin was already pretty strong, and Khrushchev becomes unpopular among elitists in the Soviet Union, and that, of course, causes his fall from grace. But whatever. It's interesting. Any thoughts to kind of finish up from from a sociological perspective, this overly short, I'm saying that if you're still listening, version of the Russian Revolution? Uh, No, not really. Just like, you know, we didn't talk about any of it because we're not, that's not the goal of this. It's really just a revolutionary process. But the idea of like how this looked in the real, what was it like to live in Russia at the time, right? Where were you working? Where were you living? And so forth. Like, we don't have time to do all that, but it's very interesting to think about. And like the listeners can do their own research um, because like I said, it was this term wartime communism. Like that's where it comes from. It's trying to implement this political and economic way of living life, but in the middle of like conflict that's at times even global, I mean, and then even when Stalin takes over, it's just a very short time before World War II kicks off. So there's never a time when they really got to get going, you know? Right. And even when they did, like the various like sanctions and so on and so mm-hmm. forth by other like Western bodies. And, and, and I mean, that kind of forced their hand to be a little bit more uh, militant than they probably would have been. Yeah. Right. Like, and that's I mean, that's, you, you know, well, whatever. That's for a different episode. I was like, people wake, don't just wake up one day and they're like, you're evil and you're not evil. Like, that's not a thing. There's the instigation, right? Mm-hmm. There are there are, there are are two sides to every story. So. Right. I mean, and like the one benefit that I always talk about is beginning with Lenin, then he dies very shortly thereafter the revolution, and then continuing with Stalin. The one thing that they were very, very successful at, and it had all kinds of negative ramifications in other ways, but was taking Russia from essentially feudalism to a world industrial power relatively overnight compared to how fast it took other countries to achieve that same level of production. Right. And I think it was not sustainable, which is Mm -hmm. they did it so quickly that it wasn't sustainable. And like I said, other global pressures instigated by the UK, by the US predominantly. And of course, eventually after World War II, their NATO allies Mm -hmm. um, further made it more difficult. So some of like the starvation and whatever we see about the Soviet Union was not necessarily self-inflicted. It was outside instigated by by the West. But that's again, that's that's for more of a Cold War episode that we will will be building towards. So, okay. Take us out, man. Oh, you can find us online at our website, revolutionandideology.com. Um, if you would like to support us, you can find out how to do so on the website. Um, if you really, really like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.